you know Hans Nelson? He, yeah. He's been on yeah. my channel multiple yeah. times. He he came up with this term. Uh, I don't even came up with it, but he, he said it first. I think he came up with it, but he's been thinking through this a lot himself. He called this thing a uh, meat space GPT. And meat space GPT is like this, like uh, the way I conceptualize, I don't know if these are his exact words, but it's almost like it's a... Um, it's like the most advanced Unreal Engine ever made. Like Unreal Engine, right. for people that are not familiar, it's this sort of a video game engine that makes games move very realistically. It sort of like tries its best to uh, simulate the real world if, from a physics standpoint. So you know, when you get shot in the, in the oh, nobody gets shot in the shoulder, but if you get shot in the shoulder, you know, your body reacts properly based on the weight of the bullet, whatever, you know, or you stop right. on a rock here, whatever. So it seems like, it seems like by solving, by using the method that Tesla used to solve for self-driving, they've also created a system or something that is the most accurate representation of the physical world. And so the, the, in theory, this system or thing can be used to solve not just for self-driving, but really anything in the physical world if you scale it up big enough and you take it into the future long enough. Right. Is that a is that a fair way of characterizing what the future of this could be? Yes, is, that's a yeah. question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. Uh, and I don't. Okay. I don't think we're talking about far, far future here. I think that I'm sure in parallel they're running of a. We need we need a new term because it's not full self driving, but full self optimist version twelve. I'm sure that they have a parallel version of that working on the robot too. It's learning a different vocabulary, but it's probably probably very very similar. Um, uh, like it's like Latin, pardon me. Right, it's like Latin. So like the yes. thing is Latin, yes. and the car uses English and the and the yeah. or whatever you know German. It's like they have similarities, but right. each system uses. Like oh a no, I think thing. it's even closer than that. I think they're both okay. They're both speaking in Latin, but one of them has a vocabulary that's like this, and the other one has a vocabulary that's like this. And so they have slang. They have, yeah, well, they have different words because again, you know, the optimist oh. has to interact with objects that are really different. And of course it has a much more complicated- I see. Output. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so it's like- The, the car's never going to face chair is what you're saying. Like exactly. you're not going to have chair in the, well, hopefully. <laughs> I, well, actually, in all honesty, it probably <laughs> will might. because every once in a while you're driving down the highway and there's a chair in the road. Yeah, so. there's shit yeah. falling off pickup trucks all the time here in Texas. So you will probably see chair. Okay, sorry, continue. My, but no, my no, but I mean, I think that's what it is. It's a vocabulary issue, not a, a, a basic language issue, if you want to put it that way. Now, one thing that's okay. really interesting, and this is something that, uh, you know, Ashok and, and especially Elon have kind of teased a few times, is that they're working Tesla, not XAI, is working on a large language model, and that I have a suspicion that they are trying to, now there's two options. Number one, you take your end-to-end -end network with that we don't understand, and you plug a large language model on top of it so that you can say to the car, like, boy, I'm really hungry tonight. And it goes like, what do you want to eat? And you're like, oh, I'm in the mood for Mexican. And it's like, well, here's three really good choices that Yelp likes a lot. And, mm. you know, just a natural language. But that's like fluff on top of the basic system. The other option, which is way more intriguing, is inlining the large language model. So actually having that be part of the full self-driving stack, which would mean that at any point you could pull out what it's thinking <laughs> because then what you're doing is you're integrating an english slash whatever language uh, a human readable language into uh, the mix which would make it much less of a black box you'd be able to go in and ask it what it's doing and say it'd be like oh i'm thinking this right now so that to me is really intriguing i have no idea if they're actually doing that but they have definitely hinted that they're working on a large language model right now so it's almost like it's almost like you you embed the translation the translation layer into the thing that's processing the real world which it's using to make decisions right so in a way that we can understand for right. every every time it has it I hate, this word is like insane to say out loud but anytime it has a thought yes <laughs> <laughs> it will think in english or yeah, in whatever or at language. least be able to translate it for us. So it might be like okay, English okay. as a second language. It, it's used to speaking. I don't like, like this conversation right now, John. This is scary. <laughs> <laughs> the car's, the car's going to have to dumb it down for us. Basically, that's what's going to happen. It's going to be like, I have so many thoughts and these humans are so slow. Let me just turn it into some really bad language. Because the one thing is that probably whatever language it has that describes this 3D world is probably really, really efficient. 
the fact that it's able to run so quickly and it's able to um, run on 100 watts, which is pretty remarkable, it means that it's got a very efficient description of the world. This world model is super compact. And by the by, this is super geeky, but I did a, a, a video two years ago now. I had to go back and dig around and find it. Um, but it was on Tesla. They published a paper about inventing a new numbering system. And that, I think, has been critical to their ability to run as fast as they can. It's called Configurable Flo Floating Point, or CFP8, and I'll try to remember to put a, a copy of it up here. But anyway, definitely watch it, because they, Elon, Elon has, spe has specified several times that they run on 8 bits, and that's one of the ways that they're able to operate the cars at such high speed, because every time you double the, you know, the, the size of your numbers from 8 to 16 to 32 to 64, it, it's a lot more memory bandwidth. It's a lot slower to process it. And somehow they've managed to squish everything down on the computer that's in your car, not the training computers, down to 8-bit floating point with a variable mantissa, which is really geeky. But, but basically, it adjusts its scale it has like an exponent and digits after the after the dot, right? So it's like a number might be eight point, or let's take pi, 3.1415 or something, right? So you've got the number, you've got your integer number, and then you've got a decimal point or a comma for everybody else in the world. And then you've got the numbers after that. Well, this configurable floating point number, what it does is it adjusts the, um, the caret, the 10 to the power of, to make that number... What, the problem with a, with a, a low-resolution number is what instead of 3.14, what if you had 0.00000314, right? That number on 8-bit is going to just be zero, and that's no good. But what they've done is they've created this thing where they can variably adjust dynamically what that uh, floating point, like, um, raised to the power mm -hmm. of basically is. So they can adjust okay. it so that it's always 3.14 and it just kind of has this thing that's like, oh yeah, and there's a bunch of zeros in front of it too. So it's like 10 to the minus sixth or something like that, or it'd be binary, but anyway. So um, it's very, very interesting how they, they did this numbering thing. And that seems super esoteric, but it's really important. I, I don't know if you've heard, okay. so you've heard, so just, just real quick, like chat GPT, right? No, Llama, sorry. Llama because that's open source. Yeah. There are people running Llama on not only like a phone, but even on a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Like, I heard that. Stupid, yeah. So the reason they can do that is what's called quantizing, which is exactly what I'm talking about here. You just crush the resolution of these numbers from 64 bit down to eight. But in order to do that effectively, you have to have this variable floating point uh, mantissa thing. So anyway, it, it's okay. really fascinating, but super geeky. Sorry, folks. <laughs> no, no, it's good because I think this is I'm trying to wrap my head around how this happened. So so let me let me try to uh, figure out what you said in a way that I like it will okay. stick in my brain. So. So. Unless they had that thing, uh, they they would have had a. I don't know what to call this, but a data set or something that would be really, really large and very, uh, it would take a lot of time to process because there's so many, uh, so many numbers they have to go through. Right. But once they implemented this, I don't know, converter, whatever you want to call it, this thing, uh, now both the size of the, well, I guess, um, how many numbers it has to go through. So, okay. So help me understand why this is important. Maybe like where, yeah, where yeah, yeah. Okay. in the, okay. So let's start yeah. with, um, <clears throat> we'll keep this all in base 10, even though professor Gibbs. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no. Okay. So all of this, awesome. just understand Send me an invoice. <laughs> all of, <laughs> you're on my show. I don't need invoices here. <laughs> you should send me one. Um, uh, but anyway, so just remember this is all actually in binary, but I'm going to do base 10 because I can't just do binary in my head. But but so again, we take a number like pi 3.1415926, whatever it is. If you want to do that in 64-bit base 10, you have three and then 63 yeah. numbers after that. That's a big number. And every time the computer wants to calculate with it, it has to read that number in, calculate on it, spit whatever the result out is, and then, you know, move on. And if you do that, like all uh, a tensor is, all that a neural network is, <clears throat> is um, is is like billions of these. When they talk about, you know, mm. chat GPT is 174 billion parameters. That's all it is. It's 174 billion numbers that are really, really, really big numbers. And so if you have to do this, whoops, if you have to do this, if you have to do this to 174 billion things multiple times a second, it's going to eat it. It's just not going to be, you're going to have to have a whole data center. I see. 
Yeah. So what you're doing is you're taking that number and you're going whoop, and you're squishing it down to eight. So 3.1415926, I think it's about exactly how much I remember. So now that's a lot faster to pull in. It takes a lot less memory to store, faster to pull in, faster to calculate on. Not good for training because you need the resolution when you're training. You need big numbers so that the tiny little adjustments are, are kept track of. You want that resolution. But in inference, which is the part your car's doing, all you care about is getting a result that's close. So even though this number is not exactly right because it's missing all of that other stuff, it's close enough to do the job it needs to do. And it takes uh, for, let's see, 1632. So it's like 4x less you know numbers than a 64 bit number and it can read it takes four times less storage space four times faster to load four times faster to do the calculations on everything is so much faster so yeah got it and that close enough is 10 times better than a human once this thing is fully once they have all the data points they need assuming that they are correct yes assuming <laughs> i mean correct. we don't okay. know that answer for sure until we get there but it should be adequate if if they have to go to 16 point a bit that would be a big hit on their part but Generally speaking, you know, these numbers with that much resolution, 8-bit eight, eight resolution. Now, it is binary, so the, effectively you're looking at maybe like three or four digital uh, uh, base 10. So it might be 3.14. But for the purposes of, what you know, I don't know how much you use pi and your calculations and daily life. But, you know, when you do... Rarely now. <laughs> yeah, I know. When you do, for the most part, 3.14 is a perfectly adequate substitution for like having this gig Yeah, I mean, you can go and you can tell python to like generate pi to the 150th digit and you can use that yeah. for all your calculations but why there's no purpose to it unless you really yeah. need that incredible resolution and for driving you know we're talking about like a couple of centimeter accuracy here it's not it you're not talking about nanometers and and so you yeah know, it's yeah adequate. it's adequate okay it needs to do that's super helpful so so what that basically means is that to to get it to a point where they're just limited by frame rate that 36 yes. frames per second, they've right. they've figured out how to implement a converter type thing that would allow them to process all the data that would be generated by the system what in whatever step uh, to be processed in a way so that they're only limited by how quickly the feed comes in and not the computer calculating what is happening. Exactly. Is that a fair way? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? and that's that's why it's beautiful, <laughs> 36. So, but just yeah. remember, like when they're doing the training, all of the stuff that they're doing in their two or $3 billion data centers, all these very expensive things, they're using high resolution numbers. And, and you know, they, they, they want to keep all in of the training as they do the training. But when yeah. they wish it down for the thing that they send to your car, like the software update, that's just, <laughs> they just mash Got it, it down. Yeah. And yeah. so let me ask you another question there. So because the training has so much resolution, if in theory, God forbid this happens, but, or who cares if this, I don't even know what the answer is here, but <laughs> if they're in a situation where the, they need to go to say, I don't know, a hundred frames on the cameras for whatever reason. Right. And they need to, and then at that point, then, um, and, and then for the, for the, uh, for the, uh, um, for how deep the numbers go in the car, like wh when it spits out a number, instead of it being 8-bit, it needs to be 16-bit. In right. theory, Tesla could do that because yes. they have all the, all uh, in the in the training data set, they have all the resolution down right. to the freaking whatever number they may need right. in the future. So it doesn't become a thing of, oh my God, we don't have enough data that we've collected. It becomes in a thing where they have to say, okay, uh, oops, we, we thought we could get away with 8-bit. We actually have to go to 16-bit and we have to go to 100 frames, but it's okay. We have all the data we need. It's going to be a kind of a B-I-T-C-H to get there, right. but we have what we need. We have yeah. what we need, yeah. right? Okay. Is I that think, a fair? Um, and it becomes a hardware problem. Yes. And, and, and clearly, okay. it, Hardware 3 has Hardware 3 cameras, which are 36 frames per second. So they never need to go faster than that with Hardware 3. But in some, you know, hypothetical Hardware 5 world with 100 frame per second cameras, yes, they, they could just go to 16 bit because all they do is when they crush it down from whatever it's native, I don't know if it's 128 or 64 bit, but when they, when they quantize it, when they squish it down, they just go to 16 instead of eight. And, and so super easy. Got it. <laughs> like, Got it. So no okay. problem at all. So one thing I think a good analogy here is um, if you've done any photography and you take like a raw photograph 
and you look at the size of that photograph, that's got all the details, every single pixel. Yeah. And it might be like 12 megabytes or something, right? It's really big. But then 250. <laughs> 250. I mean, it could be that. Yeah. But I'm just saying, so it depends on the size of your camera. But just yeah, yeah, let's yeah. just say 10, could be 100, whatever. But if, if it's 10 megabytes for that raw photo, you can do a JPEG compression of that, which is to our eyes, unless you zoom in, indistinguishable. And you can probably get away with maybe a couple hundred K maybe 500 kilobytes, mm -hmm. something like that. So there's these orders of magnitude less because what you're doing is you're quantizing that data. Got you it. don't actually need... Now, if you're going to go into Photoshop and you're going to like do really cool stuff with it, yeah, you want that raw photograph because you want every little teeny bit of detail as you're messing with it. And that's the equivalent of the training. But when mm. you output it, which is the equivalent of the inference, it's just like JPEG compression. It's just like, I see. yeah, it's lossy. Yeah, it's not exact. If you zoom really far in, you can see it. Like you'll see that there's like chunky, you know, you'll get way in there and it'll yeah. be chunky and the outlines will be a little bit jagged, but it works just fine in the real world. I mean, the whole, you know, the universe of, of the internet, like JPEG images are everywhere on websites and stuff. And people do not complain about that. They're not like, ew, JPEG. So gotcha. That helps. Actually, that that's a tremendous help. Thank you. 